Yeah, we're here with another episode of NoKFaber.com. Former three-time WCW World Champion DDP, I want to thank you for being on my show. Glad to have you here, Nestor. <laughs> uh, can you speak on your early years as a kid? Growing up? Yes. Um, bounced around. You know, my, I often say in my speaking uh, engagements, uh, by the time I was three years old, my mom was married, divorced, and had three kids. She was 19 at the time. And uh, I ended up going with my dad, and my brother and sister went with my mom, who had my turn and my grandmother raised them. And my dad was, he was a cool guy, but you know, full of testosterone and full of party. So I ended up bouncing around from one family to another like a pinball. When I was eight years old, I finally landed with my, uh, with my grandmother because my old man was going down to Florida to try to, you know, with his new wife, who was, who was my mom for a while there. She was pretty cool, but always very cool. Uh, she helped raise me. And uh, he went down to Florida, and I moved in sort of with my brother and sister, who I hadn't really known. And um, I was a hellion, you know. <laughs> I drove with a buddy of mine named Jimbo today, and I kept explaining to him, no, get in this lane, get out of the sheep lane, get over here, <laughs> yeah, but we can't cross over there. I'm like, <laughs> in my second... Second grade teacher, I'll never forget Kimberly, my, my wife, uh, we were married at. Uh, uh, we were going through my book and we got old report cards that they had found. And my second grade teacher wrote on the bottom, Paige doesn't think the rules apply to him. <laughs> well, Sounds like a kid to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I read about everything that you just said. Mostly, that most thing that stands out to me is that you didn't grow up with your mom. So, well, why, why, why did you know why didn't you grow up? Or why did she leave y'all? Well, she wasn't that she left. She had to make her money. You know, yeah. my dad, like I said, he was a partier and he he enjoyed going out and having a cocktail after work. And he's a hard worker, but he party a lot. You know, and uh, uh, my mom had to pay the bills. So. Yeah. My grandmother raises, but she, you know, she come down on the weekends. It was funny because coming up in here into New York, I mean, it's exactly the way we came in on the tunnel because your twelfth birthday, you, know, you got to go to New York or whatever. So I would spend time with her, and she's oh, like, cool. she's like, she's like my big sister, yeah. you know, still today. You know, she, she's awesome, man. She's, that's cool. Uh, we have an awesome relationship. That's cool. I was just wondering if you know how to have a relationship, but to this day, you know. Mm -hmm. Did did your pop stay in touch with you after you left you with your grandma? No, uh, not at all. From um, you know, he would call, but and this is where it really pisses me off still to this day when someone says they're gonna call me and they don't yeah. call me back or you know, and I do it too. But yeah, it's because yeah. I'm crazy busy. But everyone who calls me at some point, I'm young, I'm gonna call yeah. you back. <laughs> you know, no, not for nothing. I, I, I don't want. I've dealt with a lot of wrestlers and a lot of them. You know, they get back to you later. Right. And you was one dude that I call every time I call you. Picked up. You know, Every and, single time, and and, and yeah. if, if I can, if I can't talk, then I will call back. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it's a thing that's with me. I'll call you back. You know, we'll hold on, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. Or he call me all oh, fucked up. You know, and, yeah, yeah. you know, before you know, he's all happy. You know, he starts crying. You know, <laughs> like like hey, stop the crying. You know, as a little kid, I start crying. I think it's my fault. You know, but you know, as as, <laughs> as life went on, and we ended up getting you know older and. I was spending some real time together, you know, because my old man tried to fix it, you know, to a certain degree. He made a lot of bad decisions, but he's got a real good heart. He's just a real partier, you know. And you know, I'd be like, "Stop fucking crying! <laughs> you can't do that when you're out with my boys," you know, because very emotional. And I understand yeah. where it comes from, but you know, it uh, <laughs> only floats so far with me. I hear you. All right, I read. I read. I read, I read about once. Most of the times when I look up, I, a lot of times I do it off my knowledge. Right. But when I get a little stuck, sometimes I start, you know, I look up a little bit, and I don't believe everything I read. So <laughs> I'll, sure? I'll, 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 I'll write down what I think I should ask, and then I'll ask to see if it's true or not, you know, because right. I read it or whatever. All right. I read you have a reading disorder. Oh yeah. Yeah. How was that in school for you? Oh, being brutal, man. You know, with. Uh when you've got ADD and dyslexia, and I didn't know, I knew, I just thought I couldn't read. I mean, there was no such thing when I was a kid, man. <laughs> there was no such thing as ADD or dyslexia. Yeah. And I just thought we were stupid, but I knew I wasn't stupid. Yeah. Because I could make a lot of things happen around me. And, you know, when you can't read, you listen. You know, and you really pay attention. Some of the greatest, you know, 
performers of our day, Muhammad Ali, Jay Leno, those are just two of the two top guys with crazy work ethics yeah. that got around. I mean, Ali being one of the greatest orators of our time, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. But, you know, a lot of people say, God, your vocabulary and, your, and the way you, you know, carry on a conversation, it's very articulate. Well, mm -hmm. I learned that by listening to people who yeah. really sound, okay, that guy knows what he's talking about. And if you right. say a word, I don't know what it is, I'm not gonna have a problem going, so what does that mean? Yeah. You know, tell me. I do the same thing. Yeah, you because know, that's, that's how you learn, that's how you, you learn, know? Yeah. And uh, when I went to, um, you know, 30 years old, I'll never forget, given to one of my guys, one of my closest buddies, his name is Smokey, and he wrote my first book with me. And I can remember, um, I can remember uh, me handing him like the sign for the nightclub, you know, because we'd always have the different, you know, what's coming up, hot legs contest, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And when I gave him the note, he looks at me and goes, what functional literate wrote this? I said, me, I can't read, so stay close to him. Because always words in music, you know. Yeah. But when I was 30, I was like, I fuck, I gotta, I gotta take control of this shit, you know, so. Yeah. I started practicing reading, and I, I read Lee Iacocca's first book, which I found him really inspirational, and it grabbed me. So I, I set a goal for myself: I'm gonna read one page a day. Really? I'm gonna read this fucking book. Wow! I never read a book. That's you know? good, man. And and I and I read it. I read a page every day. Sometimes I read two, but I have to go back and read it again. Sometimes I have to go back and read that page before. Yeah. And I read chapters or whatever, and, and I'll still like I haven't read this in a while, so I'll go back and just and I can skim pretty good now, but. I actually went to a, a learning, uh, a it's called the Eris Center in Hollywood, and uh, about six years ago, uh, since now it's 2012 for time's sake, about 2006, 2005, I went to, um, I actually had a surfing accident with this guy. Yeah. I dropped in on him, and I didn't know, and dropped in means you're, you're surfing on a wave, and then you, this guy's coming down, and you drop in on him, and I didn't know, because I cut and took off and, and I never saw him behind me and he came from behind me and sort of like pushed me and scared me because I was who grabs you in the water yeah. when you're on a board, you know? And we both flipped over and he ended up getting gashed and almost got in a fight. <laughs> but we ended up becoming really good friends. His name is Billy. And uh, at one point he was telling me about, you're dyslexic, I am I'm too, you gotta meet this woman Ruth. Yeah. Back then she was 85. Wow. She said, I took home more homework than any student she'd ever had. I wow. went like, twice a week, every week for like four months. How old were you? 40. Wow. <laughs> 49. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, I That's just good, wanted, though, man. I, I wanted to be able to read better. Yeah. And, and she gave me these little tricks where your mind works just like you're, you're working your muscles, you know, uh, yeah. you're moving different things around and, you know, and right, so which way did she do the flip card things? Then she flipped back, okay, which way did these go? And, and it's just like you use muscles in your mind. I'm thinking little kids who can't read should be doing this. These exercises, yeah. not going A, B, C, D, <laughs> you know, they should be friggin' because that's just memorization. They need to start to trigger their mind, and it really helped me a lot. How long did you do it? I did it for about five months, and then I felt I was so much, getting so much better, and I felt like I'll come back at another time because I got way too busy yeah, with what yeah. I was doing. But I still didn't, you know, I read all the time, I read everything, you know. I still man. suck at reading out loud because that's what really killed me when I was a kid. You know, like, oh, God, they're coming up to me next. You know yeah. you're going to read. Everybody's reading the paragraph. So I'd pull that little girl's hair or get myself thrown out of so, class. Yeah. So you know? did you finish high school? Oh, yeah. I got through. You went to college? Uh, well, yes. I played basketball. <laughs> you did a little bit of college. Yeah, yeah. I did. Mean, it was like. That's ah. good, though, man. You had that you know, disorder. You still was able to finish. And, yeah, I cheated. You know? I used to call myself the king of cheat sheets. You got that diploma. I got that diploma. That's what no, I no, I got, the, I got the high school diploma. I wasn't going to go without that. Um, and I got lucky, the teachers liked me though, you know, because, yeah. you know, I, I was charismatic. And, Where uh, you grew up again? At? In Point Pleasant, New Jersey. In Jersey? Down the wow. Shore. Yep. Wasn't too far from me. I grew up in the Bronx. All right, what are your first memories of wrestling? Uh, first memories of wrestling would have been probably, uh, you know, when I first got, you know, dropped off at my grandfather's, uh, uh, house, my grandmother, and just watching those guys who were bigger than life and wasn't really 
keyed into everybody's names or whatever, and they were just, you know, from Bruno San Martino to whoever it was, but I don't really remember their names. So it was names. WWE? Yeah, WWE. Yeah. WWWF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember three three W. Yeah, the three W. Yeah. Worldwide Wrestling Federation. Federation. Where I really got <laughs> tapped into it again and got brought back in was, um, but I wanted to be when I was a little kid, man. That's all I wanted to be. I mean, I talk about wrestling, 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 but really? I, my mind doesn't really remember back to who they were and what you know really jarred me. But it did when I was a teenager, and when I was about eighteen, nineteen, uh, back in the seventies. Really love Handsome Jimmy Valiant, and he, the Boogie Woogie Man, you know who he would become. But Handsome Jimmy Valiant, part of the Valiant Brothers, would I believe Captain Lou was their manager at point. Not really sure if Lou was their manager or not, but I know that Jimmy stood out to me because he's long blonde hair and I was long blonde hair, and you know, and he he could talk. He had to be eyes <laughs> sometimes, but he could talk. I love Superstar Billy Graham. You know, I was just starting to get to see Dusty Rhodes would come up through there, and uh, I love the guys with the bigger than life characters, but I love classy Freddie Blassie and Captain yeah. Lou Albano. One of my favorite uh, <laughs> moments oh, wow. between, and I'll never forget it, it's like it was yesterday, <laughs> watching McMahon and uh, um, Albano go back and forth, and you know, Vince was much more of a stooge character back then, you know, and I remember him saying, uh, Albano saying something about anyone over 300 pounds is a fat slob. And, McBear looks at me and goes, but Mr. Albano, isn't it true you're 317 pounds? And he goes, a very trim 317. <laughs> <laughs> and then my buddy, uh, um, John Shipley, uh, another local basketball town in our area down the shore, he loved it too. And we both tried at the same time. And I hurt my knee in a match. Uh, I had like three matches when I was 22. And so I actually went to do it. You know, I went to Jersey yeah. City and trained with a guy named Tito or Tito Torres. Yeah. Uh, could not really speak much English, and I'd be going, "What did he say?" What was he? Rep Spanish? Yeah, Spanish. Oh. He, he over Puerto Rico. Yeah. Nice guy. Nice guy. He was the first guy though who brought me around. And yeah. It was like two different. I did three little shows. Didn't know what the fuck I was doing. There was no such thing as, you know, talking. Or, I mean, the cl clothesline was the finish, you know, and they wouldn't smarten you up, especially at that level. And um, John ended up using the name uh, Johnny Buford. John Shipley ended up using the name Johnny Buford. Ended up doing jobs for a while there in the WWF, hoping to get a break so he ended up going to Tennessee or whatever. And he would tell me about being in the back of the car, sharing a ride with Captain Lou and Freddie Blassie in the front of the car. And I was just so, oh my God, you got the ride with those guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just, just hearing his stories was magic. And then later on, you know, meeting them was yeah. the bomb. It's man. funny you say that because I didn't, I told you I did the Tito Santana interview. And when I did it, they had me in the locker room. And so I'm conducting the interview and behind me is Ted DiBiase, Coco Beware, mm -hmm. Nasty Boy. And I'm sitting there thinking like, I'm in the locker room with these guys. Right. <laughs> So I know what you mean, you know? The first times, everyone was special. I mean, every single time that next level of guy I got to be with. And they may have been my top guy right in the beginning, you know? Yeah. It was amazing. All right, I'm going to read you something that, that, I, that I read. I, I, wrote, I wrote it down here. I didn't even know that this happened. I knew you had a problem, but I didn't know that it went this far. When I read this, I was like, oh, I wanted to ask you about this. Right, I'm going to read it to you. It says, DDP's wife, Kimberly Page, accusing Tammy Lynch of having <laughs> drug paraphernalia in the locker room. <laughs> Things escalated from there. Management confronted Tammy. She flat out denied it and offered to take a piss test. She passed the test. Scott Steiner found out and chased Kimberly out the building. She, she never appeared on TV again. DDP tried starting something at the next taping where, where Scott shooted on, shot on, on TV. And that led to a fight between y'all two. I didn't even know y'all had a fight. Can you um, explain I don't about? even, well, for starters, that whole Tammy Lynn thing, I really don't, I know it wasn't anything like that. And I know Kim wasn't on that side of that, but it got escalated in because me and Kim were tight, we're Bischoff, because we were, you know, together as friends, you know, and we'd come up together. Bischoff and I started in the AWA as, you know, two uh, nobodies. He was a producer. I was a nobody manager. Our first, now him, that was a pull-apart fight the first time. But the thing So y'all didn't fist fight? 
Me and Bischoff I'm talking about. Well, I mean you and Pope. No, no, I'll get to that. I'll get to uh, that. Um, the thing that happened with Tammy, that was like so long before that, uh, before the incident happened with me and Scotty. Yeah. But I don't really remember exactly. I know it was something that had something to do with her being busted for being high or whatever. But I know Kim didn't. She didn't bury her because she ain't going to do that. Now, I see an interview. She says she did. She no, she saying, didn't. She never did that. And yeah. people are going to write what they want to write. Now, yeah. as far as me and Scotty, everybody knows that the shit went down. I didn't know that. I, well, I'm telling you, when I read it, I just found that out. That's why I'm asking. It was really, um, you know, I really like Scotty, and I always have. And Scotty was in his, you know, time of being the top guy yeah, in WCW. Yeah. And there was, there was heat over an incident that happened between me and him. And I didn't go and I should have went and said, hey, Scotty, let's talk about this. But I didn't because I was irritated and I was just breathing through it. Yeah. <laughs> and he went on TV the same way he would bust balls on Flair. Yeah, yeah. He did on me. Yeah. And I figured, fuck, he ain't going to respect. That. Oh, yeah, he did. And I'm going to look it up. It's on YouTube? Um, yeah, he cut a pretty good promo on me. It was like, never see that. he busted Flair's balls, but he busted mine, basically called me a cunt. Right. So I know if I don't go there and fucking, what the fuck, hey, fuck you, I'm not, you know, was, right in space, I'm yeah. done. Yeah. And it was really surreal because when Scotty went, fuck you, when we landed, it was like 20 feet away. And when I was like, oh my God. I, it was like so many surreal moments happened over that period. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. You know, uh, but, you know, I've got Scotty in the front face lock, and I'm trying to, you know, like, holy shit, I've got him. How'd that happen? <laughs> because he put his head down and drove me, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it got to the point where, uh, you know, they came, they separated us, and what happened was Scotty has a freaking long nail, and he had went to, you know, when we went down on the ground, he got his hand around, and I'm thinking, Fuck, is he trying to take my eye out? And he was. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was heavy. But when we got up, boom, it was a pull part. And I didn't even know I was bleeding. Yeah. It was all from the, 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 you know, the what yeah. you call it. And it, what ended up coming out of that is, of course, you know, we left, you know, friggin', because um, there was like, no, you got to go. We got to calm this situation down. Yeah. And then after that, me and Scotty ended up fucking, when you finally let your shit go, and there's been so much shit written on the fucking internet or blah, blah, blah. I don't give a fuck. All I know is that I have a good relationship with Steiner, and that's how I want to keep it. So y'all cool now? No, oh, but that, after that incident, that's it was good. like, when I, when I came in, because we had to do the sit down with Eric, you know, after that yeah, point, yeah. when I walked in the door, and I had some scratches on my face and shit, you know? Yeah. Looks like it's, you don't look so bad. And we just started <laughs> laughing. <Yeah. laughs> you know? That's how friends do. Friends and well, that's, fight, you know, man, and, and sometimes just got to blow off steam. And, yeah. you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, like I said, you know, me and him go back to when I was the manager and yeah. helping him with promos, you know, and at the end, yeah. because it's just so funny that promo came back to bite me in the ass. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, do you think WCW exploited your wife and your marriage? I, heard, I read they had Playboy magazine spread on Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Macho Man's hand as the end of, as the, like an NWO angle or something like that. Yeah. It's one of those positive things. Now, here's what happened. Here's behind the scenes. They're not doing anything with me. I'm, uh, the Diamond Cutter's getting over, but it ain't like, like Kurt Henning had just come in. And Kurt made like super money coming in. I knew that. And I felt like I was not Kurt Henning, but I felt like I was, you know, an up and comer and I could be up in that spot. And when I talked to Bischoff about money, it was always, you know, that friendship thing, and yeah, and, no, you know, I heard you say that before. Yeah, you know, and it, it it hurt me, you know, yeah. financially. Yeah. And um, when it came to uh, <laughs> the whole Playboy thing, Kim had done blondes, blue nets, and redheads, a bunch of satellite Playboy stuff. She had done. Um, I don't know, that's the one that sticks out of my head. Of and besides celebrity dudes, but she had done like five different layouts for for Playboy yeah. and she said to me one day I talked to Cynthia K she was the one who controlled all that and she said um, I uh, I talked to Cynthia and she wants to put me and you in the celebrity nude sex like, me what do you mean me she goes well they want you like you know tying your boots and me just about to put something on I was like okay cool 
you know, so I go, let's shoot it. So we went and shot it. Did it. And they loved it so much, they said, will you come back? We want to shoot a full layout. So they did like, went from a two page to a six page. Now I didn't tell anybody, but I know this thing's going to come out. Yeah. So Eric and I are having a beer, at, you know, like we a lot of times would do at the uh, at the Longhorn. I go, hey, Ed, I think I better tell you, I got a I got a layout in Playboy coming out. And he goes, you got a layout in Playboy? What are you talking about? He said, well, it's not really me, it's Kim. And I told him the situation. He goes, what? He goes, are you crazy? He goes, that you could lose your job over that. We go, well. It's not like you're doing anything with me anyway, bro. Yeah, it's not yeah. permission, right? You know, it's like, hey, it's like, you know, you're always better to, instead of asking permission to say I'm sorry. Yeah. But, you know, I said, hey, if they fire me, maybe Vince will do something with it. So then, like, I guess a month or so went by, and then the thing comes out. And that's the number one best-selling satellite issue ever. 19, I want to say 96 or 97, whatever it was. It was right before I took off, so I had to be 96. Not to be 97 because we used it. Whenever it was, next thing I know, Eric says, or maybe Sullivan, whoever said it to me said, what about using that Playboy thing as the angle? I was like, really? Because <laughs> I know it's going to get me over, you know, no matter what. I mean, I had the hottest woman to ever be in professional wrestling. By the way, that woman had her master's at Northwestern. At the age of 21. Wow. Today she's in you know, real estate, I mean, not real estate, but a, uh, a marketing executive, you know, and uh, that's the, that she was ever involved in wrestling to begin with was an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, I've I, 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 I seen her interview, how she got in and all that. All right. What was your beef against Jay Z and Damon Dash where you accused them of stealing the diamond cutters? <laughs> well, that one I can only say this. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> they do it, I know what you mean. You got that class of it? Um, all I'm allowed to say on the Jay Z situation is the matter has been resolved. Oh, yeah? I'm not allowed to say anything else. And, Good I, got, enough. and I got a lot of respect for him. And I've always said that to him. He said, entire. You know, ride that you know that I was on, you know that that went down. Oh, thanks. Appreciate. It. I've always said that the entire road ride that I was on, that uh, I feel like uh, I feel like Andre the Giant. Andre <laughs> loved his wine. I don't really yeah. know personally, but I've heard a lot of great stories. And Nash too. Nash be drinking. Oh, that's, oh, that's all he drank. The last time I was with Nash, we drank six bottles. I should say, I came close to drinking two. Yeah, Kevin, come on, open that last one. Jimbo, you got to try that. It's an on our own. That's awesome. I, uh, I poured some before you got it. Oh, you did? Okay, cool. Very tasty. Um, so, uh, I had a lot of respect for Jay coming out no matter what, because of everything he had accomplished. And back when I sued him, he was top rapper and had his own... Oh, so you call. sued him? Oh yeah, that's, I didn't know that. Wow. Oh, yeah, well, that's that's what the incident is. I can't talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, I and, got you. and like I said, as I went through that whole journey with him, I had a lot of respect for him the whole way through. And yeah. when it's all said and done, it's sort of like you know, whoever I have any kind of beef with, I don't want any beef with you after that. Yeah. I'm a positive motherfucker. Yeah. You know that, and that's how I want to stay. In your opinion, what's the biggest reason for the demise of WCW? Um, well, first of all, a lot of people talk about the demise of WCW. Um, they don't know how the inner workings went. When when WCW went down, and anybody can check the ratings, I mean, it's easy. You just go back and Google it. Uh, we were doing anywhere from a 3.5 to a 4.2, which are huge numbers. But our payroll was really hefty back then. Yeah, because when we were doing the 5s and the 6s and the 7s, you know, that's what... You know, it's why it's why shows are taken off the air, okay? With in Hollywood, when you get to notice, you don't really see past the seventh or an eighth show ever, because everybody gets too expensive. Yeah. And there's a guy named Jamie Kilner who came on, and you have to understand that Warner Brothers was brought in, that AOL was brought in, that yeah. Warner Brothers took back over, and it was a, and Eric Bischoff was Eric Bischoff's a genius. I mean, on so many different levels for what he what he ever achieved with and against the WWF and that war and what he's done today he's got a ton of shows on the air his whole 
Bischoff Herbie, they've got a bunch of shows that are on television. It's really hard to get a show on television, and they've had a bunch, and still do. But um, he um, uh, he was going to buy WCW with a, with a group that he had together for blah, blah, blah. $50 million. Yeah. So the deal was, this is the inner side. Again, I know the back door, the outside that really nobody knows because I was there. Um, and it makes Eric shine, but it's what really happened. Um, Eric had raised that money, and he was going to take everyone's contracts and everything, and the contracts that were left over, the, the WCW, or I should say Time Warner or Turner would have to pay, was upwards of $30 million. So really, Bishop was really taking on an $80 million debt, but he had something. He had the whole WCW brand. He had all of that. And um, the, he was the, I believe the deal was that he had to do 10 years on TBS. And Eric wanted to take it to Fox. He wanted to take it to CW. He wanted to take it somewhere else besides Turner. He wanted to bring it somewhere else. And the deal that was made for him buying the company was still going to be, you got to be on Turner TBS for 10 years. So he agreed to it. And this guy, Jamie Kilner, comes in, who now sits in front of him. The guy that Eric made the deal with was a guy named Brad Siegel. Well, now here comes a, a, a guy from Warner Brothers, <laughs> okay, who says, so we're selling WCW. Why would you give him 10 years of television? Well, it's the number one rated show for the last 35 years, or whatever it was. And he went, well... It's not anymore. We're canceling the series. Like canceling a series that's been on your program for 35 years, that's not crazy. giving any care or concern to they did that. all the people who work there. Yeah. <laughs> Forget the office, the camera crews, the directors. I mean, everybody. Like, guess what? You're all fired, even though your ratings, maybe because you're, if they would have went back and said to some of the boys, take less money. Maybe some of them would have done that uh, to keep the job. Because what are they doing, big corporation? Uh, what are they doing for? Closing the company. And anyone. But mm -hmm. he, Kimmler had like a personal thing. Yeah, he didn't like wrestling problems. And there you go. That he said, that had to be that. I don't even know who he is, but that's what it sounds like. It, it, it's one of those things that he did not want to be known as the wrestling network anymore. Yeah. You know, and since then, he was fired pretty much pretty quick after that. Oh, yeah? But... Look what TBS has done since then. They got pretty good their own programming and all that, but they still could have done that and still had wrestling. Let me ask you a question. USA's done it. I know Ted loved wrestling. Ted there loved was no wrestling. way he could have overrode he anything had, that happened there. He didn't have control. If Ted oh. had control, it would have been there. I think, you know, I can't believe Vince McMahon hasn't put Ted Turner in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> you know, really. Yeah. Especially coming into Atlanta. Or maybe they have tried and Ted said, now I'll pass. You know, who knows? You know, you, you never know that, you know. All right. I seen a shoot on you. You said um, you said you called Randy Art and gave him the idea by using diamond cutter. Dark hair, as he calls it. Right. All right, I watched this DVD. He didn't give you credit. I know, man. That blew my mind. When, when Randy didn't, like, when he didn't, I thought at the beginning, I thought it was work. I thought he was just being a heel. And because, I mean, I remember where I was when I called him. Yeah, I heard you say you called him. Yeah, so I thought, I asked Dusty in the beginning, I said, is Randy like fucking with me? Yeah. Why would he do that? Why, I'm a big fan of his. Why yeah. would he do that? He said it dead serious, too. Oh, I know, he dude. He said it dead well, serious. Oh, here's what happened. Once I realized, okay, because I let people say, oh, no, he's just he's, he's a being a heel, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But then when I hear it again and again, I'm like, now wait a minute, I know exactly what happened. I have to go confront him. Because that's who I am, I have to confront you. Yeah. But it's not like, hey fucker, I'm not yeah. like mad. I just, I, he was walking, I went to SummerSlam. Was it SummerSlam? Whatever it was, they were in LA. And I, li I, I lived out in LA for 10 years. And Randy was coming, he said, hey Diamond. I go, hey Randy, you can I talk to you for a sec? He said, sure. I said, Randy, I said, do I have heat with you? I went, no. I said, well, I gotta ask you, bro. 
to, you know, obviously Diamond Cutter RKO, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all right oh, there. Do, do you remember me calling you and saying to you, man, I really want you to use the finish? And it, what happened was he said, oh, Diamond, I, I can't do that. That's your finish, man. I go, dude, I'm done. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah. I mean, you, I heard you say yeah, that. Yeah, he said, I got to tell you, Diamond, I don't remember that. Wow. Now, he then said, he then said to me, yeah, hi. well, but not so much that, he, he had the shoulder. He, it was right around the time he had the shoulder surgery. Yeah. So he could have been all like, uh, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, looking back at it, it wasn't like, it was like a conversation. I don't, I can remember that conversation being a little like, oh, Diamond, yeah, I can't yeah. do that, that's yours. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and then I'm like, oh, fuck, maybe he never did. Maybe, never maybe he didn't. And he said, well, if you say it's true, I believe you. I go, Randy. Make that up, yeah, <laughs> you know, true. and because I mean, because yeah, everyone tries to start, and everyone ever says, if you came back and work, who would you ever work with? I, there's only one person. It'll never happen, but it's only one person. Cool. It's him yeah. because uh, it'd be RKO against. I, I already fucked up in the WWF, not going and freaking doing people's champion against people's champion. Yeah. I did what they wanted me to do, and that was a total mistake by me. All right, let me tell you, when I heard that. I listened to your idea, man. And it was hot. It made it fucking, was, yeah. It I can't so believe hot. they didn't go with yes, that, Yes, I'm eating man. a chunk of cheese. It's $27 a pound. I can't awesome. believe they didn't go with it. I can't believe it. That, that was a way better angle. Chan like, I can't even picture you as a stalker. Yeah, dude. You know, like, come it on. It was awesome the first night. And if Take and I, if we were where we are today, I mean, I was the enemy coming in. And I was seen as the enemy. I never knew that. Why would I think that? I've never done anything negative. I'm a huge freaking supporter of the WWF my whole life. Even when I was in every company, I go, I'm ending there. Like, that's my dream, to end in the WWF. I watched since I was a WWF. So I didn't really think there was anything really negative going on there. But I forgot that we were the big bad WCW trying to put your company out of business, even though that wasn't my objective. And I never thought that that would happen. You know, I never thought that they were going to put out, but they were on the rocks for a while there before Steve and Vince hit that thing and boom, took them off. And, um, you know, for me to be, you know, there, I, I just thought it was going to be, they know. But they really, you know, they don't, they never, meaning they, the people who are trying to control your career, yeah. they really don't know. They can act like they do. I don't care what business it's in. Um, but I learned the biggest lesson ever. I had this dream, and I'll tell it again here because it's another interview. I don't think I've ever talked to him. I think I did. I might have said this in another interview before, but when I first met The Rock with The Big Show, I was walking in the locker room, and you know we, we went to the back, and uh, um, it was the first, and it has to the first place I'd ever done anything with WWF. Where I was the driver for Honky Tonk Man I'm and big, I, I got it, I got it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and here I'm there. Now I'm on top of the world. I'm top, top, top guy. Yeah. And it's night. It's going into '99 or '98. I can't remember where, when it was. We were. They were wrestling at a house show, WWF, and we were wrestling in a pay per view. And. Uh, um. Pat Patterson, who I'd sent my tape to originally. And when he saw me, actually, Classy Freddy Blassie brought my tape to Pat Patterson through Lee Marshall. Remember Lee Marshall? Yeah, yeah. That's how I got him. Freddy, I was the biggest mark ever for Freddy Blassie. I mean, Diamond Dallas Plates, Classy Freddy Blassie, that's why those names are. You know, common. I'm trying to so, come as close as I can. Would have managed it. That would have been pretty. I never thought about that. Yeah, that would have been a good combination. But, but I just I, I was trying to get a name as close. Yeah. The classy Freddie Blassie. As, there isn't one. Yeah. But uh, Diamond Dallas Page is, and you know, tribute to someone like Freddie. So when Freddie brought my tape to Pat, and Pat's like, "Yeah, he looks great. Good. You have good energy. But look at him. He's like six foot eight. <laughs> you know, as a manager, he's like Andre the Giant. So, yeah. boom, I was dead. Yeah. So now I'll be getting later, five, six, eight, ten years later, nine years later, 
probably nine or ten years later, to be with Pat Patterson getting off a plane, <laughs> pulling our bags down in first class, and him saying to me, you know, Diamond, you really turned it on its ear, man. He goes, I'm so proud of you. He goes, he goes what you accomplished in this business is amazing. And, and uh, long story short, I said, Pat, you know, you guys are wrestling tonight. Do you, uh, you mind if I come by? We're off. He goes, sure, come by. Never thinking I'd come by. So I came by. <laughs> they rushed me right up to the big show. Sweet. That's the main that person. Was Cadillac? Well, oh, no, this is, this is, this is, the, I came by just for the show. This is getting off the, the uh, plane with, um, with Pat Patterson. Okay. And then I went to the hotel. And I said, to Kim, I'm going to go to go see WWF tonight. So I went to the same building that I drove the pink Cadillac in, oh, okay. where I was in my first WrestleMania oh, okay, in. My you. only WrestleMania. Me and Undertaker, by the way, are undefeated. I want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I, I went to the show. I did the show. You want to take a little break here? Yeah. Come back? yeah we'll come, yeah. come back with that. Yeah.